three jobs that require you to hold your nerve. The pilot riding monster waves of Maui in his chopper. The men who've got the guts to clean up after murder. And tracking leopards for a living. Which of these extreme jobs would most unnerve you? Twenty metres high, with a speed of 50 kilometres an hour, this is Jaws. If a surfer wipes out here, chances are he'll be crushed, then drowned. But for one man, playing with Jaws is a job. No less skillful, and every bit as dangerous. Who would fly a chopper within metres of the tube? Tsunami-like waves pound the shores of Maui and Hawaii for only a few days each year. Meet the man who rides them from the air. Donald Shearer, extreme helicopter pilot. Before every flight, he makes sure his Hughes 500 is primed for the job. Now all I have to worry about is what I'm looking at, where I'm going, taking care of the helicopter. Is it going to kill me? You know, or is it going to try to kill me? Am I prepared for something to go wrong? With 27 years on the job, Don Shearer is one of the world's most experienced helicopter pilots. Every flight is as good as the last. Flying's incredible. I mean, anytime you leave the ground and you have control over where you're going to go and what you're going to do, it is done. It's, it's almost the freedom that a bird has. One of my friends, when I was a kid, he taped wings on his wagon and he rode it off the roof of his house and broke both of his legs because he wanted to fly. And so did Don, earning his pilot's license at the age of 18. He now owns four Hughes 500s. At around 350,000 euros apiece, he must put them to good commercial use. Some jobs are more fun than others. The, uh, the film industry, we do a lot of movies, a lot of film work throughout the year. He works on about four films every year. Remember the breathtaking surf sequences in the James Bond Die Another Day? Guess who flew the cameras? That's because Don is an extreme helicopter pilot. Landing on a 10-metre tank truck is a snip. A good year can reap a wage of around 80,000 euros. It's not all bond stunts and firefighting. Uh, the job that I do involves the police, the uh, national park, the navy. More often than not, he's out in search of shark attack victims over the deadly Pacific surf around Maui. I don't think people have respect for where we are in the world. We are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We find people that go out here in the ocean, they don't have flares, they don't have an ELT, they don't have cell phones, nobody knows where they're going when they're coming back. The ocean out here feeds off joyriders. In the last three years, seven people haven't come back alive. Sometimes we'll find like the cooler, we'll find the life vest, we'll find uh, parts of a boat, we'll find the sail if it's a windsurfer. A jet skier is missing. They won't find his body. At least, not if the sharks get there first. November and December are the busiest months. Ocean swells from as far as Alaska hit a barrier reef less than a kilometre off Maui, driving waves 12 to 21 metres high. It only happens five to 10 days a year. A ride on jaws can last up to a minute, a very long time for surfers. And the first time I was hired to go out there, I went out there and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Just the power, the awesomeness of it. And then here's these two guys who were surfing and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The ocean's so powerful here to see the waves build as they do and crash uh, onto the uh, shorelines is just incredible. It, it's just such a rush to see that. Three-dimensional flying, forwards, backwards and sideways, allows Don to fly close to the edge. And the only platform to really see it from is from a helicopter. 
I could literally sit out there for hours and just watch the waves. Stay clear of the spray. It could send the chopper into a death spin. Nevertheless, photographers need Don to get close to the action. Morning of the World Championships. He's got a record to defend, as well as responsibility for 15 employees, pilots, mechanics, office staff. Add to that the job of minding the surfers. These things are made to fly, so if you maintain them, then there's nothing that's going to go wrong with them. I mean, you, there's always a chance of a catastrophic failure occurring in anything that flies. I can't think of any aircraft that's ever been produced that hasn't crashed. My biggest fear in flying right now is a mid-air collision. Today, Don shares the skies with a second pilot. The danger is evident. One unexpected gust of wind could spell disaster. I've had a lot of near misses with people that have flown in, almost flown into me, or people I've almost flown into. The first surfer tows out to the break point, 50 kilometers an hour to stay ahead of the wave. Then gravity and pure adrenaline take over. This is going to be a big wave right here. OK. Oh. That is the big one. Whoa. The best in the world must be at one with his machine, listening to every change in noise level and vibrations. It's down to Don to calculate optimum distance from the wave and the surfer, plus the angle and speed for the photographers. The pilot makes the pictures. Nothing in this job is predictable, except the 20 seconds or so this surfer's got to get out of trouble before the next big one rolls in. Don too is caught off guard by two waves colliding. If you do have your engine failure there, you're not going to a smooth, hard surface to land on. You're going in the water, and then you're going to get mowed over by some massive wall of water coming at you. And uh, it's hard to justify why do you put yourself in that position? Is this really worth it? Why am I doing this? You know? If some of those surfers saw what I saw with that wall of water coming after them, and they're literally feet in front of it, they probably ask themselves, why am I doing this? It's just incredible how Mother Nature is and, and the power of it. I've actually thought of it to the point where I'd take all my good radios out, put my junk engine in, strap on a scuba tank, and fly actually into the tube. I have thought about that. The problem is nobody's willing to pay me five million dollars to do something that stupid. So how are Don's nerves now? Boom, you'd be in there. Do you have the Teflon neurons needed to heli surf with 20 meter waves? You'd think staying on terra firma would be safer. But you may change your mind when you meet a leopard doctor. Coming up later. But first, if this job doesn't put you on edge, nothing will. This is crime scene cleaning in LA. They are some of the gutsiest workers going, and you're about to find out why. It's a dirty, gruesome, and thankless task. But Neil Smither made it his career. He's now a millionaire. When he started out eight years ago, there was little competition. All that's changed, but Neil remains one of the most successful in the industry. There are almost 50,000 homicides and suicides in the United States every year. Someone has to remove all that blood and human tissue, all in accordance with the strict federal regulations covering disposal of medical waste. Neil used to be a mortgage broker. Now, his crime scene cleaners number 300 people nationwide and tackle 4,000 jobs a year. To do this job, 
you need a strong stomach and mental toughness too. And in Neil's case, he was actually driven to pursue this as his dream career. His inspiration? Quentin Tarantino's movie Pulp Fiction, which turned crime scene cleaning to a very cool trade. And it pays well for those with the innate qualities to handle it. 30,000 to 60,000 euros a year. Six figures, maybe, if you run your own company. Living near a violent area can suddenly pay off. Neil believes in leading from the front. But no matter how many times you witness death, the horror never quite goes away. The assailant at this gas station smashed the safety glass for the cash box with his bare hands, slashed his wrists, then bled to death. Just a routine job for Neil and company. But the station owner is already at it. He could face a fine of 15,000 euros for improper disposal of medical waste. Better to pay Neil less than 2,000 to get the job done properly. Hey, don't do that, it's illegal. Did you call us? Pardon me? You called us to do the cleanup? Yeah, we did. Okay. Now, you put in the dumpster, was that bloody? No, no, no. That, that's what the rag, the paper. Did it have blood on it? No. Okay. I Good. will touch it with Good. <laughs> Excellent. Neil's first job is to assess the damage and call in the right number of cleaners. Every trace of every crime scene must be sterilised. Forensic and medical experts pick up the big pieces for evidence. Neil's team is left with the scraps. Clotting blood, bullet holes, tissue stains on walls and carpets. Anything that powerful solvents can't clean goes to a landfill for incineration. Neil's employees are trained to handle blood-borne pathogens like AIDS and hepatitis and equipped with protective suits, double filter respirators and chemical spill boots. They've all been offered hepatitis B vaccines to reduce the risk of contracting this deadly virus on the job. They're also called on to dispose of illegal drug-making equipment. And sadly, most common of all, the removal of rotting bodies from homes where death passes unnoticed. Then there's the odd and very suspect request. The guy lived in Palo Alto, called us in to give him an estimate to clean up the stairway. And we gave him an estimate, and we never really heard anything else from him. But it wasn't long before the real reason for the call-out became clear, and it was pretty chilling. We were eventually called by the police to come clean the property. Uh, he killed his wife. He pushed her down the steps and, you know, killed her and hid the body and trying to shop us for a cleanup. Many crime scene cleaners used to hold jobs in public health, emergency services, and the police. The crime scene cleanup units um, are private companies. Uh, however, they're usually staffed by ex-members of the police department. And they'll know how to do things like remove safely the biohazard material, seal up the ballistic strikes or the bullet holes in your walls, and remove other items such as uh, print dust, which uh, the police department will leave behind and attempt to lift fingerprints. Uh, that print dust is also a carcinogen, so it's important that that is properly removed. Now, bioterrorism jobs often top the to-do list. Companies compete for the privilege of cleaning up after anthrax attacks and other chemical crimes. And Neil is branching out. Animal waste disposal and decontaminating homes unfit for human habitation. Is there no end to the perks on this job? Back at the gas station, it's no guts, no glory. Well, what happens is this gentleman has a problem. The police tell him that he can't touch the stuff, so they call us. And uh, we jump in a truck, and what we're doing specifically we're getting the coagulated blood up, and we'll hit these trails with our enzyme, which will liquefy it and kill it, and then we'll wipe that up, and then we're out of here. Real simple. Real simple. Go back to bed. 
Both client and law demand the job needs to look as if an attempted robbery never happened. After the enzymes break down blood and tissue, Neil gets down and dirty with his team. It's a two-hour job, and the cleaners make light work of it. Other contracts can take days to complete. Even before the job is over, another call comes through. What do you got? If you love your crime dramas and want the inside scoop on death and murder, you would love this job. But working conditions are tough. Salary is attractive and job satisfaction can be high. But you'll need years of experience and a lot of determination to stick it as you make crime disappear. Next up. Another job that calls for a tough, yet compassionate approach. But this one is in Southern Africa, in the heart of the Kalahari Zerik Savanna. Nearly 600,000 square kilometers of sand and bush. It's paradise for Professor Jacobus Dupi Boffman. He's 65 years old, and just like the animals in his sights, this job is rare. He is a leopard researcher and doctor. To be a good teacher, you've got to be a researcher. And to be a good researcher, you've got to be a field researcher. You have to have a feel for the area, you've got to have an, a passion for an area, and a passion for a specific animal to be really successful. Jacobus heads up a team of trackers from the Centre for Wildlife Management at the University of Pretoria. He's a world expert on Africa's most elusive big cat. He monitors them to understand more about how they survive in the wild. The work is hardly glamorous, physically and mentally exhausting, spending long days and nights, often risking his life. But to monitor leopards, first, you have to locate them. And given this cat has been specially designed by nature to be silent and stay invisible, finding them requires equal amounts of natural affinity with the beast and ingenuity. Without radio collars, these animals would be almost invisible. they're continually on the move over a vast area to hunt and eat once every two days. So how do you catch a leopard? First, from 33 years work in the field and know-how on where the animals move and hunt. Second, be extremely vigilant because scientists aren't always the only ones doing the tracking. Time to worry when you can't see the animal you're looking for. A large male has been stalking them all morning. The most anxious moment is now, when he's showing his face. Leopards have been known to hunt and kill people when provoked, so this is serious. But how prepared can you be on this rugged terrain when an adult leopard designed for ambush charges at you and your jeep takes a puncture? Hair-raising work. You need to know how to keep your emotions in check until the leopard relents. Would you change tyres now? Not without a tranquilizer gun. The one tool a leopard tracker can't leave home without but they must be quick. 
Jacobus helps keep leopards and people apart. It's a big task. Once tranquilized, time is not on their side, nor on the leopards. It's constantly monitored for stress, and with each passing minute, the drug wears off. They have 15 minutes to fit a collar. The leopard is finally left to regain consciousness, and the team is off in search of another. But where? This is Jacobus's backyard, and, like his subjects, it's got a good nose for the job. A second male is quickly collared, but they notice he is dehydrated. It's probably why it was so easy to catch. A saline drip and quick first aid saves its life. Two big males in one day is enough to celebrate, even by Jacobus's high standards. It's time to enjoy the African night, one of the perks of the job. <laughs> Next morning, a new casualty. A cat has been spotted and it could be in trouble. Although the nearest settlement is several kilometers away, you can never rule out poachers or angry farmers. The team wants to find the leopard first. Jacobus is right on track. Good record keeping is part of the training. He has tracked a female in this area before. He calls in a support helicopter to scour the bush. Her markings are familiar and she's wearing an old collar. Now for the mercy guns. Sedation and relocation will save her. Fresh blood on her paws, but it's only a minor injury. What satisfies Jacobus most is knowing that the leopard is safe. Leopards living nearer to people aren't always so lucky. Job satisfaction? 10 out of 10. It's a risky job which could do with extra staff. To step into Jacobus' shoes, you need his knowledge and preferably a PhD. The ability to face endless days under blazing sunshine and freezing desert nights with a passion to save a big cat that could kill you. Do you fit the profile? Three nerve-wracking jobs. <laughs>